Hello and welcome to my review about the Gypsy Switch. This book here, the Gypsy Switch and Other Ritual Journeys, which is by Jill Smith. And I cannot tell you how much of a precious and fascinating and inspiring book this is, but I'll do my best. You can see that I've read it quite a number of times already because I've had to weight it down with two pebbles because it just springs back open where I've just been looking at it and sticking bits of paper inside it for my for my own reference. Um, I did I was lucky enough to read this when it was in manuscript form and I shall just very quickly read you the quote from what I said about it when it was in a manuscript form which Jill has used in the back of the book. I'm just very quickly going to read this because this is not about me but it does explain an overview of how I feel about this book. Jill has an extraordinary gift for magical storytelling. With an enviable economy of language, she manages to convey another world to us, one in which enchantment, myth and mystery aren't marginalised but imminent. She weaves this vibrant, untamed reality with the one we recognise as every day, in a way that is authentically convincing and deeply affecting. And that is so true. But first of all, let's just quickly whiz through who is Jill and how did she end up making these extraordinary journeys well Jill was is um, a, an, an actress um, she trained for a while at RADA um, she was a performance artist with her husband Bruce Lacey she was Jill Bruce part of their partnership um, she was involved in in the Alberts and the Lacey's I'm just going to quickly show you a picture uh, of them. This is the Lacey family. She is a wife and a mother and a full-time um, worker. She she was supporting the family at one point. Bruce Lacey, who you can see there on the left, her husband, who is no longer with us, he passed away. He was a, a renowned eccentric inventor. Fairport Convention even wrote a song about him. Um, he, he was very well connected in the art world and very prolific and quite influential and Jill was his equal in, in all ways but is not necessarily recognised as such and should be and I hope that this book will go a little bit of the way or to, to encouraging people to look into what she contributed which was extraordinary and there are their three children. Um, one of the things that Jill did during this period was be part of Andrew Logan's early alternative Miss World competitions which are very um oh what's the word as usual words have disappeared this is why I had to write notes for this video um yeah yeah they're they're very they're in, infamous events basically um and there is Jill looking absolutely stunning at one of those she was involved really intimately with with all the most innovative people in the art world during the 70s, late 60s and 70s. Um, but primarily she was um, an artist on all levels, performance uh, and later on um, a, a, an actual graphic artist, illustrator and a writer. Um, but it's, it's so hard, she's done so much, it's hard, it's hard to kind of synopsize this. Um, the Lacey's moved from North London and ended up in East Anglia. They were involved in a lot of the fairs that that happened. Marvelous, wonderful. That that I'll leave links to to um to some of the fairs in the in the description. All all the things you'll need to know about will be in the description box below this video. Just quickly show you that here is a picture of Jill. I hope you can see this. A lot of these pictures are available on Jill's website, which I'll also link to. This is Jill at a an Albion moon fair, dressed in clothes that reflect lunar energies. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, so that's those are the sorts of things she was doing. They moved to East Anglia into what had been a farm, and Jill began to, through her performance, the ritual performances they were doing, and through living there, she started to have an awakening and started to think of the earth as a she and perhaps as the mother that she'd never known because unfortunately Jill's parents both died when she was two years old and she was brought up by her grandparents in North London, coincidentally in a street that I ended up living in myself. <laughs> 
another one of those strange things. Um, although I didn't meet Jill till till many many years later, we ended, we we had shared the the same road in common. Um, moving on, so she started to experience a, a very deep awakening, um, and uh, and she says herself that she felt as if she was receiving a transmission from everything about everything, and because of this sudden and powerful uh, transformation, she began needing to sleep outside of the house and for the first time she says she watched the dew form in the silence even hearing the sound of it she was having a lot of very intimate profound sacred experiences with with the land on her own because she suddenly just couldn't bear being inside the the, the family home she needed to sleep outside directly under the, the stars she needed to be sleeping directly on the earth and, and, and have nothing between her and everything else um, and she then with with Bruce her husband and on her own that they, they started to um, do lots of performances and make pilgrimages to places or sacred sites all around the country and she made her own journeys to places like West Kennet where she had very deep experiences which uh, heightened the process that she was going through and all of this took her further away from from her family and from society but deeper into ancestral ways and into mystery and into things that, that had suddenly become absolutely alive and vital for Jill and then um, in the midst in the midst of the magic she was feeling she was always very concerned with with the mundane that this book is absolutely brilliant at weaving those things together you know she she won't shy away from saying how concerned she was about paying bills and and little everyday niggles and worries she she mentions those as much as she does the big things she's not trying to make out that this happened and just swept her away she was still she had one foot in 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 both realities and managed to hold them together right the way through her life, which which is, we'll come back to that anyway. Um, in in 1982, I'm skipping over quite a lot here, and when you read this book, which I really hope you will, or when you look into her work, you'll find out that I, I'm I'm missing out a lot. But in, in order to keep this video manageable, I have to. In 1982, um, one of the key points is she felt called by Kalanish the ancient um, stone circle on the Isle of Lewis in the Hebrides, the Western Isles of Scotland. And she did her first journey, her first amazing walking journey, which was from Boscownoon, which is a beautiful stone circle uh, in West Penwith, in, at the, the foot of the British Isles in, in the far land's end of Cornwall, right up to the brow, the brow of the land, uh, Kalanish thinking about it the, the 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 Isles the British Isles as being female and the the, the brow being that Kalanish I'm just going to tell you very quickly on page 43 yeah I know I know you're used to me being completely uh rant haphazard in my in my um ways of doing things now it doesn't matter it's the content that's important Okay, um, she, what she said here, and you can probably read it yourself, but I'm going to read it to you. What did she do? She, she says, in researching her own past, she made a list of what she made when preparing to leave. I had no tent. Okay, I had no tent. I took one or two folded sheets of, of plastic, a sleeping bag and a woven cotton rug, which I would roll up and tie on the top of my rucksack. Nowadays I wear good strong boots, but at the time I wore little black cotton shoes with a button strap. Does anybody know those shoes? I do. She thinks they were Tai Chi shoes. They were very popular in, in the 70s and 80s. And <laughs> mostly she just had her bare feet inside them and that's what she walked. Majority of, of this journey, this first journey on. And she also took a camera to document it and some something to draw as well. For the first time she was starting to to create images of, of her travels. Um, what have I got? I've got a note for page 45 here. What's on page 45? Oh, the professional poppy strikes again. Right, yes. 
she says, I didn't feel I was walking out on my family or abandoning my daughters as they had their home and their father and our lives had become very separate anyway. I think naively I imagined they might be proud of me, might think it exciting to have a mother who went off on such adventures rather than being dull, boring and grey. She also thought it was about time Bruce took on some of the routine day-to-day -day things of being a parent, which had always been left up to Jill. And she says... I felt I had no choice. So powerful was that feeling she had of of making these journeys. And um, what have I got next? Page 82, 83. As you look at me. Oof, oh dear. Right. Uh, what have we here? Now on page 82 and 83, she explains a little bit about how she survived doing this. How did I survive sleeping out with no tent through the winter, sometimes in wind, sometimes in frost and snow, sometimes in rain? Um, I can't read all of this to you. I'll just kind of skip through it. The main thing was learning how to dress, layer upon layer, everything overlapping in the middle. Um, I had no idea what I looked like and I didn't really care. I loved lying there under the sky, but if it was windy but dry, I'd position my rucksack to shelter me from wind. I'd borrowed a down sleeping bag, which made a lot of difference. Um, it's important to have the warmth under you rather than on top, as the earth is cold under your body and drains the warmth from you. So she'd sometimes put cardboard or newspaper underneath her as well. Um, in the frost or occasional snow, although I wasn't ever out when it actually snowed on me, I mentally wrapped myself in the cold with my warm self inside. And Jill has described this to me in person and I can see how it, how it worked for her. I'm absolutely convinced that it did. Um, she would be aware of the cold, but she wouldn't let it get into her and a visualisation became a form of practice. Um, and then she just she explains a few more things and um, says she never got ill, she never came to any harm. She always had some food with her, like oat cakes. And then she says, there you are. Now you can all do it. And she's absolutely convinced that we can because she, she knows that, you know, that although she has this extraordinary drive and, and conviction and a purpose that was, was so shining and bright to her, that that she did believe that she was completely ordinary at that and she still does that anybody can do this even though people continually ask her but you know how did you do this it's impossible well there she there she says it that's how she did it and you can do it too so she kept being drawn back to the isle of lewis um i think i've got one more reference there on page 99 quickly um yeah this is one of her sketches of the one of the journeys that she made um, which started at Greenham and went right up through Oxfordshire to our below Stone Circle, right up to the uh, to the brow and down again the other side. And that's how she saw the journey as being part of the female form of the British Isles. Um, so she she was walking for a great deal of the way, and she sometimes went by bus if she felt that a particular part of the journey was a real pilgrimage she would walk for miles and miles she did start hitching again at some point um, or she started to hitch and she found a way to sort of charm up the right person she never had any problems with hitching there's tons of stories in this book about how she hitched who she hitched with how it worked out the best places to do it um it's very practical this if you want some advice this book it's not it's not in any way just Jill rambling off it's 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 got all sorts of things in and a lot of guidance about how to do this yourself if you should want to but at some point as well um Jill already had the three children that I showed you the photograph of she also got pregnant and gave birth at Tally Valley or TP Valley and she had move that out of the way she had Taliesin who I have been privilege to know myself as a, as a young man. This is Taliesin. I just wanted to show you this picture because I've never seen a photograph of a newborn baby that looks so wise, so filled with the other world that they've just come from. It's just an extraordinary photograph. I would just, I hope you do get this book just so you can look at this picture yourself. This baby has brought everything from another realm 
into this realm. You can see it, it just emanates that look in the eyes. Anyway, yeah, superb. So she gave birth to Telly, but that did not stop her. She, as you can see from the cover of the book, which we'll come back to, she carried on going with Telly. In fact, he was an integral part of, of everything that happened. She then um, embarked on the Gypsy Switch, which is something that most people are interested in, although I think her solo expeditions are just as, if not more, interesting and impressive um, and inspiring. But she did undertake the Gypsy Switch with another two people and a wagon or trolley, which she pulled with a horse called Polly. Lots of stories about Polly in there. <laughs> she sounds an amazing character. What have we got? One, four, five. Here we go. What did I have here? This is what the Gypsy Switch was. It was a journey around Britain. Whether this was a traditional journey or not, it, it, it doesn't really matter. Jill thinks it doesn't matter. I think it doesn't matter. It's just this is what they did, whether it was something that, that Romney people did or not. So it was basically going around Britain, or the British Isles rather, um, it, as regards to particular um, astrological signs of the time. And you can see there, I'm not going to read them all out to you, but it starts off in Gemini with Appleby, which is the traditional horse fair in Cumbria, and it ends in Taurus in Ireland or those are the that I don't didn't it didn't start off in that order but that that's that's um, all of them not it didn't start off in that order and some places were stayed in for far longer than others you will have to read the book I insist <laughs> um, it's at some point during this the, the gypsy switch which was an extraordinarily it was hard, very hard going at times, not only because of the fact that she was travelling with, with a newborn baby and two men and horses and wagons and all the things that of learning how to do that. She didn't know how to do that. She learned it all. Um, she went off to Australia and um, with her friend, met her friend there, uh, Lynn, and who is a fascinating character as well, or was. She's no longer with us either, unfortunately and learned a lot about the the dreaming paths and and the the uh the ways of the original people there which is also extremely interesting another highlight for me and a lot of other people including the chap that wrote the foreword what's his name jeremy della uh it's important for a lot of people this that um as part of when she came back from australia she stayed with the anarchist punk group Crass at Dial House in close to Epping Forest in Essex in in southern England. And a lot of people are fascinated with that. Um, don't think Jill remembers too much about the, them. But it, if you don't know anything about Crass and Dial House, I'll, I'll put in some links about them too. Because for me personally, they are very, very important. Pivotal in my own journey as it were although I haven't been there I should have gone there but I haven't been there to visit them they do still I think have an open house policy and are extraordinarily generous people um G Voucher and uh Penny Rambo are the heart of it and always have been so she went along I'm gonna to have to hurry up now she went she went along I'm gonna make maybe have to make part two of this she went um, she was on on the gypsy switch, but at some point they, she decided that it was going to be better for her to go it alone with Tally and a tent. As you can see in front of you here, with Tally in a snuggly on her front with a tent and a rucksack on her back and two bags in her hand. And I find this picture absolutely, I mean, it's why it's on the front cover. Uh, the co-op bag <laughs> they're such they're so prosaic and mundane amongst this magical fantastic almost superhuman feet this little thing here was jill's this is jill's sink <laughs> it's a plastic container she she explained all this to me once that was her washing up bowl uh, that that's how she did it folks that's what she did it's true um yeah so then she walked she was part of walks for life put peace peace actions at greenham all sorts of things an extraordinary extraordinary journey you have to read this book because it's like no other thing you will ever read 
and page 339 you'll be glad to hear I think is my final yeah these are Jill's shoes after completing her gypsy switch journey and as you can see worn out and I've included those because not only is it important and and sort of touching that that these little shoes carried her all that way but the echoes of, of my Wild Spirit transformation card, the old worn out boots and the pilgrim on the new path of transformation just ties in for me very nicely. And I have made a whole video on this Wild Spirit revamp, so have a look at it if you haven't already seen it, please. Where are we? Okay. I've got four minutes to try and cram this in. I might not be able to. I might just have to make a brief part two because Jill's book is not worth me just gabbling. But basically, it doesn't matter whether you agree with what she did or not. The basic premise is that you can do this. Whatever this is for you, you can do it. It doesn't have to be a pilgrimage, pilgrimage or sleeping under a hedge or, or um, a ritual journey it doesn't have to be any of those things it's just what the thing is that you think you can't do or people are telling you you can't do you can do it here's the proof you can do it this small powerful woman did it you know and she's no different I can assure you than anybody else except for she has absolute belief and faith and she is not afraid as in what I said about Ray Beth She's not afraid to be herself. She is completely fearless. She's got, she's, this book is full of plenty of ordinary human worries that she has, but she has no fear. She's no got any, not got any fear of herself, of her true self, her true nature, or of the opinions of anybody or society or others, or even her family, or she doesn't seek approval from anybody. Um, She's got no fear of the land. She's got no fear of the of the denizens of the land, be they human or not. And her desire to live her beliefs, to actually live them, to walk the talk, literally, is is it outweighs any transient personal concerns that she has. And she has lots of them, but she overrides them. It is an absolute triumph over all sorts of small adversities and some quite big ones too. And she literally shows us step by step step by careful step in awareness how to be ourselves and how to fulfill our purpose and it makes us really think what have you come to this reality to do whatever it is do it just do it and in that I have to draw a similarity with this lady here Jordan her, name, her real name is Pamela Rook this is a book that I have read recently this is Jordan um, I just want to quickly show you. This is Jordan walking down the King's Road in the mid 1970s. Now look, the King's Road is a grey place and she is walking down there looking like this. She was the first person to look like this. She came up from on a train from the south coast of, of England, Seaford. She came up on a train, a British Rail train, looking like this when nobody else did. Nobody. This was well before punk. She was the first. She came up looking like this. She hasn't even got any underwear on. That was her. She had no choice. She had to be herself. And it's strange because Jordan's story and um, Jill's story coincide because they both knew Andrew Logan. They both knew um, Derek Jarman. That there was there's lots of coincidences. If you fancy another really fascinating book, whether you're interested in punk or not, Jordan's story is also good. I'm going to have to make another video just quickly to round this up, and at the end of it, I will just give a quick catch up as well. Okay, I'm going to finish there. Just have a very quick part two. Please join me for it because I will hopefully give you something else of worth. Right. Back for part two. Lots of love. Bye.